Hey, folks, today's episode is sponsored by Easy, the new Netflix original series from Joe Swanberg, the director of Drinking Buddies. This eight-part anthology series explores a diverse group of characters as they fumble through the modern-day maze of love, sex, technology, and culture. Featuring an ensemble cast including Orlando Bloom, Dave Franco, Emily Ratajkowski, and, hey, oh yeah, me. That's right, I'm in it, and it's great. All episodes are now available only on Netflix. We're also sponsored by Squarespace. Whether you need a landing page, a beautiful gallery, a professional blog, or an online store, it's all included with your Squarespace website. Start your free trial today at squarespace.com and enter offer code WTF to get 10% off your first purchase. Squarespace, set your website apart. That's a, that's a new read on that. All right, let's start the show. All right, let's do this. How are you, what the fuckers? What the fuck, buddies? What the fuckinistas? What the fuck, Tuckians? What the fuck, Canadians? What's happening? I'm Mark Marin. This is WTF. This is my podcast. Welcome to it. How are you? Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Hope work's going okay. Keep doing it. You can finish this run. That's it. Put another 10 pounds on. You got this. I know. Trains do suck. What? You're just painting in your studio? How's that going? Just pace yourself, take your time, think it through. Yeah, do all those things in all those different places if you're listening to me in one of those environs. Look, I I got a pretty amazing show here today on my hands. I got a pretty, like, I learned some shit on this show. Today on the show, I've got Kamasi Washington, the master sax man, the new jazz guy. He's the guy. He's the, look, I, look, I don't, I, I actually, I, I think he is. But I don't know a lot about uh, the big, broad world of jazz. Since I've talked about him a little bit, I get emails educating me even more about the jazz thing. I don't know if I have time to go fully on down into the rabbit hole, but I do enjoy it. I'll talk about that in a second. Also on the show today, for more jazz information, Ben Ratliff, who used to write over at the New York Times. But you know, right, it's funny, because Ben... Right, the day, literally like the day or two before or after he did the podcast, he left the New York Times. Uh, so he's the former New York Times jazz critic. He's got a bunch of books out that I'm in, in the middle of many of them. So it's a big jazz Thursday here on WTF with Kamasi Washington. And then after that, a conversation with, uh, Ben Ratliff. How's that grab you? I will throw a little, uh, plug in here for a couple of dates that are coming up quickly. Uh, this weekend, Saturday, the 24th of September, uh, there's two shows at the Wilbur. I don't know how many tickets are there, but there's a few tickets left. I don't know for which show. October 21st, I'll be at Campbell Hall at uh, University of California, Santa Barbara. That's uh, those tickets. I think yeah, there's definitely tickets for that. Largo, October 22nd here in Los Angeles and the Ice House, October 23rd here in Pasadena. And the Now Hear This Festival, October 29th in Anaheim with my uh, producer and business partner, Brendan McDonald. We're going to do a live uh, talk thing. So those that in Carnegie Hall, there are a few tickets left, but they're, uh, you know, they're, they're aerial views, uh, November 4th at Carnegie Hall, but still worthwhile. It'd be nice to look down upon me from the rafters, but, uh, excited. I'm excited about that. Is that okay with you? Also, there's another thing I want to do. I talked to my, my buddy, um, Danny LaBelle, he, uh, I, I ran into him and he's been on this show. He was on this show back on episode 398. And a couple of weeks ago, as you know, I had God, God El Male on the show. He's the French comedian, the French Jew, the French Moroccan Jewish comedian who's now touring the States. We had a nice talk. And if you want to hear God in a little different element, he's the guest on my buddy Danny LaBelle's podcast today. That show is called Modern Day Philosophers. It's basically he talks to comedians about one particular philosopher, whether they know about it or not. He brings up something the guy wrote and you kind of talk about it. I was on it a, a while back. I talked about Spinoza. He's had Maria Bamford on talking about Sartre. Did I say that right? Colin Quinn talking about Dante's Inferno. It's a, it's a clever show. It's a good show. He's a sweet guy. So you can check that out wherever you get the podcast, modern day philosophers. And that was a, a plug out of love. Oh, the other thing. This is also a plug out of love because I'm involved with it. You know, look, 
a lot of you guys have been with me a long time, and a lot of you guys have seen my growth or my spinning or my uh, my uh, my cycling around with uh, incremental growth, to quote the president. Not unlike a democracy, for me, in- incremental growth has meaning. It's the only thing we can hang any sort of uh, hope on is incremental growth, and I think I've grown incrementally as I cycle through the patterns that I still persist in. There's a little bit of incremental growth, and then uh, the pattern changes a bit in terms of my understanding of it. Anyways, not to be too vague, but uh, I'm in this thing that premieres tonight. Joe Swanberg, Joe Swanberg, who's been on this show and is uh, a great and very real uh, independent film d- director. He's a great guy. He, he, might, he directed a couple years ago Happy Christmas with Anna Kendrick. That was, that was funny. Drinking Buddies, he did All the Light in the Sky. He's, he's made a lot of movies for a little money, and uh, he's a solid dude and a very, a very kind of a brilliant director because I'd never done anything like I did with Joe, really. Uh, the show is called Easy. It premieres on Netflix tonight. I'm plugging it because I'm in it, and I'm very proud of my episodes. I think it's number four, but they're all really good. Each one sort of follows a, a character's life for one episode in Chicago, and I play a uh, somewhat uh, uh, over, what what is it, washed up maybe. Eh, maybe not even washed up. I play a graphic novelist who had a, had a, who had a couple of big books, and now he's released another book, and he doesn't quite have the following he has, so he's a, a little bitter, a little nervous about the future, and uh, he feels a little irrelevant. And uh, the way that Joe shoots is all improvised. And I really, look, I know I can improvise on a stand-up stage or in conversation or whatnot, but on a set, you, you just go with very basic information and you lock your own emotional choices into the thing. And I was surprised because the, sh- the, the episode I did with Emily Ratajkowski and uh, Jane Adams, who I love, was pretty, like, I watched it and I was like, this ha- this is kind of deep. It's funny. It's sad. It's deep. It's sweet. I mean, it had all these things that when I'm in it, I mean, I can only feel what we were doing. I don't know how the hell he put- pulls all this stuff together as a director. You really got to have a, a unique way of thinking to improvise that much. And also, as you're doing it, you know, think about continuity, how you're cut in and out of things. But the whole series is great. And I- I'm very proud of the work I did on that. I'm just telling you because uh, I- I'm excited about it. I'm excited about the, that being out there to watch. So that's on Netflix tonight. All the episodes of Easy will be on. And uh, they're, they're unique. They're like little movies. And, uh, you know, they're, they're worth watching. How often does that happen? The modern media landscape is challenging. You know, it's sort of like driving past a landfill. And, you know, your first thought is, ugh, look at all that garbage. But your second thought is, I bet you there's some good shit in there. I bet you there's a box of money in that dump. Well, easy is definitely a box of money. Jazz. Jazz. Well, before jazz, we're sponsored today by Blue Apron, and Blue Apron knows that not all ingredients are created equal. That's what I love about getting Blue Apron meals sent right to my house. I open up that box, and I get only fresh, high-quality ingredients that taste better and are better for you. And they do it by partnering with 150 local farms, fisheries, and ranchers across the United States. Beef is raised humanely, chickens are free-range, pork is raised naturally, and because Blue Apron ships the exact amount of each ingredient for each recipe, you won't have any food waste. That's good for you and good for the planet. Try it now for less than $10 per meal. They'll send you everything you need to make fresh, high-quality meals right in your own kitchen. This month, you can make paprika, spice, shrimp, and cheddar grits with tomato and sweet corn, and also summer udon noodle salad With cherry tomatoes, corn, and summer sweet pepper. Are you kidding me? Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash Marin. You'll love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait. That's blueapron.com slash Marin. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. So Kamasi, Washington. Here's how I came to Kamasi, Washington. Look, as I said before, I like jazz. I got a mind for it. I don't understand it or or really how it's put together. I'm going to talk to Ben Ratliff about that. I do know it resonates with me. Like I had a cousin, my cousin Jane. 
she'd listen to jazz and it would make her anxious. She literally could not listen to jazz because it caused her too much anxiety. I guess what I have is that jazz is actually a riddle in effect. Like I'm already a little hyper and a little nuts and jazz kind of levels me out and I can sort of get fully in to the exploratory groove that the cats are, are putting out. And I can tell the difference between a few people, but I don't know a lot. I just know that when I put it on, it's always consistent. I always lock into it, whether it's bebop, whether it's older, whether it's big band. You know, I listen to some Artie Shaw. I read Art Pepper's book, which changed my life, Straight Time by Art and Lori Pepper. There's a book about heroin and a little bit about jazz. And I remember one time I saw, th this was really like this weird, these moments I, I remember about jazz is like Dizzy Gillespie was on, uh, was on, he was being interviewed on some show and I just saw him do this to like, he was just trying to do, like make an example of a swing beat and he did it with his hands. He clapped in a certain way and I was like, that's so fucking cool. I gotta learn how to do that. It was like, uh, like I had to learn how to do that because Dizzy did it to make an example of something. My buddy Dan, Cook down at Gimme Gimme Records turned me on to Kamasi Washington. He had this new record. It was it was Kamasi's first album, and it's a triple fucking record it's called Epic. So I didn't know what I was getting into, but I knew the cover of the record meant business. I knew Kamasi meant business. So I took this album, three albums home, and I put on, and I was like blown the fuck away. So many layers, so much time travel. Everything was there. It was one of these records where you listen to it, and I'm like, it's all here. Everything is all here. Everything about jazz is here. It's all leading up to this. Kamasi Washington's epic. And I went to see him when he returned to uh, L.A. He's from L.A. And he had broke his ankle. So he was just sitting in the middle on, a, on basically a throne playing sax with an elevated foot surrounded by at least 20 musicians of all different kinds. Singers. There was an orchestra musicians, you know, cello. There was two keyboards, two drummers, a so, uh, you know, a couple of horns, a uh, uh, thundercat on bass with his five string. I just was like, holy shit, this all happens in real time. Mind blowing. Had to talk to him. So this is me and the master, Kamasi Washington, talking right here in this garage. <laughs> So how's your leg, man? I saw you when you came back to L.A. Uh, that first night you fucked your foot up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's getting better. I mean, it's still not 100%, but it's definitely getting better. I can get around now. I can, I can you know what I mean? I can, what happened? Man, I was in a, I was in a Stavanger, Norway, and I, I was walking down this cobblestone road, uh -huh. and it started snowing. Yeah. And I'm from L.A., so I don't know anything <laughs> about the snow, so I thought, like, Air Force Ones, uh, yeah, I've got good grip. They're basketball shoes. They should work perfectly in the snow. <laughs> <laughs> and like I literally like we got to this real steep hill. Yeah. Like uh <clears throat> people were showing us this like really old part of the city, like all the homes are like uh, five hundred years old or oh, something wow. crazy like that. Yeah. So we got to this really steep hill and I was like, Are we really about to walk down this steep this extra <laughs> steep, steep hill? And like I started walking down it and I literally started sliding down. And I should have just fell on my butt and slid down right. to the bottom. Oh, you tried to stand? I tried to stop myself. Ah, oh. and then it like flipping, and like oh. I looked down, and my my foot was like going the wrong way, and I was like, "No, oh, man!" And I kind of like popped it back in place. Oh my god! And felt the most extreme pain. I was it was like it was like two o'clock in the morning. I was like laughing hysterically from the pain. It was like the weirdest. Oh, that, that's all you could do. That's where you went. Yeah, that's all yeah. I could do. Yeah, well, you, like, how many people you're with? There was like five of us. No time for crying. No, no time for crying. <laughs> it was one of those moments. Like it was a a a, a definitely like a, a a a very like fundamental reaction was going to happen. It was going to be a a baby type cry, like a <laughs> wah wah cry, yeah, cry yeah, yeah. or a laugh. That was, that was the only things I had. I was like, I don't want the baby cry. <laughs> Cause I'm not, I don't know all these people that well. <laughs> so I guess I'll just laugh hysterically. Oh, good. So they think you're crazy, but not, not, uh, <laughs> not a wimp. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah.
So, like, I have a lot of questions, man, and 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 I imagine I'm not unlike a lot of people. I, I imagine that when you live the life of a jazz artist, you're not going to be like, I'm going to be huge. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm gonna, the, the whole world, you know, there's only one or two jazz guys that, that, that have that, and they're not that good. <laughs> Am I, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, there's a global community around the music, and there's people that can appreciate the music, but it's sort of a, it's one of those things that not everybody gets. Yeah, yeah. But uh, do you ever teach? Um, you know, I taught a little bit, uh, uh, when I was right out of high school, I taught music theory. Uh-huh. Uh, there's a school called the Sessa, uh, Sessa School. Uh, yeah. It's Southeast Symphony's, like, weekend music classes. And uh -huh. I taught, uh, I taught theory, I taught piano, and I taught drums. <laughs> you you started as a drummer? Yeah, yeah. So let's, go, let's start there. Like, you grew up here. Yeah. And where at? Uh, in Inglewood. You come from a musical family, right? Yeah, yeah. What's your, cause I think, uh, didn't your old man play with you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he played saxophone, flute, clarinet. Yeah. Yeah, he, he was playing soprano saxophone at that, right. at that show though, yeah. Right, right. So you grow up, how many, how many brothers and sisters you got? I got six brothers and sisters. Is everybody music? Um, everybody's talented. Everybody plays a little bit of music. Pops made sure that we all play something. I'm the only one that really kind of stuck with music as my main thing. Uh huh. Like I have an older brother who's a photographer, but he also plays piano. Uh huh. I have a sister who's a painter, but she also plays uh, like a little piano, makes beats and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. You know? They all got it in them. Yeah. 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 Well, that's good. So there was always that in the house that there was sort of a necessity to have yeah. the understanding of it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and now what, who'd your father play with? Did, he, did his dreams come true? Did he do the thing? Well, uh, you know, he, he went to Lock High School, so he grew up playing with like Patrice, Patrice Russian and Dugu Chancellor and all those people. And then they're local jazz guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he played with he played with Earth One Fire for a little while. He, he did he did a lot of little stuff like that. But then when my when the brother that was older than me when he was born, uh, he made a decision to stop touring and just start teaching so he can stay in town and not and be basically right. be, be here in for the lives. kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I and mean, where did he teach? He taught at uh, Hollywood High School. He taught at uh, Southgate High School, uh, and his last stint was at Helen Bornstein. Really? So he's an educator. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and when you were a kid, was your mom in music too? My mom plays flute, but just for fun. Like, she's like more like, you know, she's a science teacher. They're both teachers. Uh huh. So she, so she would pick up her flute, you know, on special occasions on Easter. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> some people wear a hat on Easter. My mom would play your flute on Easter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a flute. That's a, that's a tough one, it seems, but and not really. Cause it, like when I saw you, like, here was the reaction I had. Here's my, here's how I found out about you. I went down over here to Permanent Records, which is a used in some new record store down on Figueroa. The guy Dan over there. And, uh, he says, Have you, did, you, did you get the Kamasi Washington record? I'm like, no, I, I don't know who Kamasi Washington is. And then like, <clears> I, <throat> I go up and I, I pick up this record, which I brought out here. It's like, he goes, this is his first record. And I look at the cover of the, your record, The Epic, and I'm like, this fucker means business. <laughs> this, is a, <laughs> this is his first record, and there's three of them in here. And it's a history of, of uh, everything. You know, and, and like, I, I bring it home, because, you know, I listen to jazz, but again, because I'm, I'm sort of, uh, uh, not, not down the rabbit hole. So I bring your thing home, The, the Epic, and I put it on. And right away, I'm like, what's happening? You know, like there, <laughs> because the first thing that struck me was the choral arrangement. Yeah, yeah. And I never heard that before in, in jazz. And then I like all the other stuff that's going on. And I'm thinking like, this guy must have spent hours producing this. And then I go see you live and it's all happening live. <laughs> like the, the choral's there, the two keyboards, the magical bass player, that wizard thundercat. Yeah. And like, and then everyone's playing different instruments. People are coming in. Some people are singing. I'm like, holy shit. What the hell is going on here? So, like, in, in what I understood, I guess I'm just going to talk at you for a minute, is it seemed to me that you were honoring the, 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 the actual honest progression of, of the jazz that I knew, of bebop and, and of, of, of that, of, of Miles and those guys that you weren't doing fusion really. You were integrating something of the history of jazz into creating something that had all elements working, balanced. Yeah, yeah. Is that true? Yeah, I mean, I, what, what I tried to make it be like is like a person, you know, like a musician has all those things. Like, yeah. Like, you know, like for me, like, I'm trying to make it like who I am, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? So I have like jazz, there's jazz in me, there's funk in me, there's fusion, there's classical music, there's choirs, cause I grew up playing in churches and stuff like that. Yeah. There's, there's all these things in there and they kind of just exist together. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, you know, that's why there's so much in there. Cause I was just like, well, I want to make a record that's kind of like me. Right. So I was like, I'll pour this in there, I'm pouring that, 
I'm pouring that, I'm pouring that, I'm pouring that, I'm pouring that, and I'm stirring it all together. And that's what and you get. See what, yeah, see what happened. I, and, I, and I always knew that that would work because I, I just felt like music is, is so much more connected than people kind of let it be. Let it be. You know, like we, we, we get these terms. And so, like, you know, when, and if you, if you go back in history, like, you know, like James Brown had his whole band with jazz musicians. Like yeah. All those guys are all kind of everything. Yeah. Everybody was everything. Right. And then all of a sudden, like, as those, individual words kind of get bigger yeah then they kind of start spreading out right but the reality is they all it's like it's like branches on the same tree so yeah. i was like well let's just get back to the tree for a little while because the branches are so yeah yeah they've got they've lost their their yeah. they've, they've they've gone into the ground and grown a different tree yeah <laughs> so you can't you can't feel the connectivity of everything yeah yeah so when you started out when you were a kid you know what was what was going on in the house what was the first music that you, you know you registered with you that way like, compelled you to, to to live the life of a musician other than your dad being a musician. Yeah, I mean, I mean, for us in my, in my house, it was like everybody's playing an instrument. When we were little, little kids, like, I mean, there's a bit of an age gap between some of us, but like the, my, my three brothers, the, the two brothers that are my, around my age, yeah, we were all playing music, and it was like kind of like a daily thing. So I, I don't even remember when that started. Yeah, it's right. Just, I, I just know I always kind of played music. Yeah. Um, but when I was about thirteen, um, well, not before that, really. When I was like eleven. I got into jazz. Yeah. And that's when I started taking music seriously. It wasn't just like, it was almost like, you know, you can imagine like, you know, a year kid, everybody rides bikes. Yeah. It's like, right. You're not like a, you're not like a bike rider. You're not yeah. like a, you know, like a stuck, you yeah. know, like once you're up, you're up. You yeah. got it. Yeah. yeah. You ride bikes because it's just, you ride bikes. Yeah. You know? and so it was like, I played music just to kind of play music. Yeah. I just played it. It was like, Fun sometimes when you know pops got too involved, he got a little, <laughs> he got heavy, you know what I mean. But but he, he got the way and let us just kind of play around with music. Like he'd get into it and be like, "You're not on the beat, you yeah, know, like that yeah, kind of stuff." Yeah, you're not yeah. playing the changes, you know, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but you needed to learn that too. Yeah, no, right. yeah. I mean, to learn, we, and we were learning right because of him. Yeah, you know. Um, but when I was about eleven, I got into jazz. What did it? I had a cousin that um his dad had a really really crazy uh, record collection. Uh huh. And so he kept asking me. Like to, um, I know how to read music and he didn't. Yeah. So he would he would bring me over to the house and ask me to. He had, he had this thing called a real book. Uh -huh. A bunch of jazz songs. And, yeah. And so I played clarinet at that point. I wasn't even playing saxophone. And, so and drums? Play, huh? Yeah, and drums. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I was playing. I mean, it, it was kind of more. I mean, I still played. I always kind of kept playing drums and piano. Uh huh. But I was always, I would always have a main instrument. So right. at that point, my main instrument was clarinet. Really, that one, huh? Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't want to. I wanted to be saxophone. I wanted to play saxophone, but my dad didn't want. He wouldn't let me because he played. Because he he was a woodwind player, yeah. And like in you know back in the seventies, you're a woodwind. If you were gonna be a saxophone player, you really had to be a woodwind player and like double. Oh, and so like, you had yeah. to get you had to know it was like that was your entry level. You, you yeah, learn the reed on the clarinet, and then you can step up to that. Because the saxophone is easier than clarinet, right? Clarinet's like a harder instrument. So if like if you start on saxophone, you're never gonna want to go play clarinet. that old honorary clarinet. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so uh uh, I used to go over his house and like you know I was I would read songs for him like and so show him how to play stuff. Oh, because he so, wanted to know how to play it, so you would trans almost transcribe it. Yeah, yeah. So he gave me a tape with a bunch of jazz songs on it, and I looked up to him, and he, you know, and so at that point, you know, I mean, I was really like in the NWA and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. And so I got this Art Blakey record, and um, I just really got into it. Yeah. And, and somehow I got my friends into it too. So we were all like, we all turned into these Art Blakey fans, and uh. And you, you're a bunch of NWA guys. Yeah, we're a bunch of little kids, uh, Sunny Fourth Street Elementary School, like sagging pants, yeah. every other word is cuz. Yeah. But we like Art Blakey. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how it starts. <laughs> yeah, and then, um, you know, so, so at that point, I'm now I'm trying to play this saxophone stuff on clarinet, and it's hard for me. What, what, what were you playing on clarinet? I was playing like classical stuff. I was playing like stuff in method books and little, yeah, yeah. Little, this little little kid stuff. I was yeah, like yeah. ten, so yeah, I was right, little, little right. kid stuff. You, you weren't l l yeah. opening it. All up of a sudden, and... I'm now trying to play Donna Lee, and I'm like, this yeah. is hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the saxophone players are making it sound easy. Right. And so one day, my dad left his saxophone out, and I just took it. I was like, let me see if I can really. If, if, he's because he's always said like, man, once you learn to play clarinet, you can switch the saxophone, and it all transfers over. Yeah. But I didn't really believe him. Right. So one day he left it out, and I just took it. And I could play this song that I really like called Sleep and Dance or Sleep On. Is it a Blakey song? It's a uh, Wayne Shorter song. Oh, Wayne Shorter, right, it was yeah. from our Blakey record. Right. And um, I played it, and uh, I, I ran in another room. Him and his friends were sitting there chilling. I was like, look, I learned how to play saxophone. It's too yeah. late. <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> Done. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he kind of just like, okay. He kind of laughing. Like, yeah. you know. 
That's where he took me. He took me to my uncle's church and made me start playing at church like that Sunday. The sax. <laughs> On saxophone. I didn't know what the notes were or nothing. He was like a real like dive in head first kind of person. So I was up there in front of, you know, the whole church playing saxophone. Didn't know. With uh, with what, uh, what, what, the, what was the music? Just gospel music? Just gospel music. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so it was like, you know, so it, it, I kind of dove in head first. And once I dove in like that, you know, it kind of really, it grabbed me full fledged. Like I switched schools. I switched like a music academy school. You like, did? Yeah. I Which one did you go? I went to the Hamilton High School. Uh-huh. And so, like, that moment, like, because it's hard to, like, the, un, like, were you aware, like, that this was, because if you're just hanging out, you listen to pop music, and then you get, you get, you grew up with the jazz in the house, but you you had that, all of a sudden, you had this personal relationship with Blakey. Yeah. Were you able at that moment to see that there was, like, a whole world of that stuff? It took a minute. Like, you know, at first I was just in Art Blakey. And yeah. I, think, well, I like Art Blakey. Right. I was Blakey. Yeah. I was, That's, you know what I mean? I he was, was your guy. Best. He's my guy, you yeah. know what I mean? And then, like, from Art Blakey, you know, I got into Wayne Shorter, which kind of led me to Miles Davis, which led me to, like, Charlie Parker. And I guess, like, playing gospel music in a church is going to give you a good foundation for that, you know, the basic core of the changes, right? Well, it, it develops your ear, because everything's right. by ear. And yeah. Everything is, like, into, it, it, it develops your ear and your intuition, because everything is intuition and everything uh -huh. is ear. It's like, there's no one telling you what to do, but they get really mad when you do the wrong thing. <laughs> 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 in jazz and in, in gospel, in yeah, gospel. Oh, I, mean, I mean jazz is a little more forgiving actually in gospel is like if you don't feel what's the right thing you're supposed to be doing if you, it's okay so you're following something yeah you're following the room and you're following the, the song may not be complicated but but it's supposed to serve a purpose yeah yeah it's a it's an inspirational thing yeah yeah so yeah. you got to learn how to lock your feelings into it and then follow that lead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They say, they say, you know, follow the spirit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if you, you know, if you're not following it, it's like, what you, been, what you been doing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what you been watching? What's, what, you know what I mean? Yeah, you, you just got, you got some evil in yeah. you. <laughs> You've been up to no good. You don't have the clarity necessary to follow the spirit. Yeah. Was yeah. church a regular part of your life? Yeah, I mean, before that, it, it was interesting because I had gone, I grew up in church, but I never played in church until then. Until you were 11. So I was, no, I was, I was 13. Uh huh. I was 13. But you say that like, you know, like I was there a long time before I played. <laughs> it's a, it felt like a long time. It felt like I've been there forever. Cause, cause I was the one thing that I, I, I was surprised at myself is that like I was playing in church and I, there were songs I'd never played before, but I heard them so much I could just play them. Yeah. And like which like, ones? Just old spirituals? Yeah, yeah, just all kind of stuff. Like the old spirituals, some of the new church songs. I mean, yeah. it was just all the songs that we had been singing all those years. Yeah. All of a sudden, I could just play them. And I was like, it kind of, I was realizing all my, my ears tapped into my fingers. And like, I, I don't even, I couldn't tell you what the notes are going to be. Right. But I could just play them. So that's that instinct. Yeah. That's yeah. got to serve your whole life. Yeah. Absolutely. So like, it, but in, and I'm picturing the church, you know, maybe in a, a, a sort of a narrow minded way that it, it was very, like, there was a lot of interaction. The, 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 the people at the church were involved. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, they, they cheer you on, even, especially when you're young. Yeah. That's all right, baby. It's okay. I know you played the wrong note, but it's okay. <laughs> Keep on playing. <laughs> it was like. <laughs> so, all right. So you go from that. So now you got a head full of gospel music. You're 13. You got a head full of Art Blakey and you're starting to listen to Miles and, and then you start going to the school. Yeah. And then do they, do they kind of refocus you on, on theory then? And, well, around about that time is when I got into John Coltrane. And then it was like, nobody could tell me anything except him. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like, really in the train. So I got to my school and like, they, I guess, I mean, they're, they're real supportive of me at, at Hamilton because they, they, they could see I was talented, but like, it, <laughs> me and, and, and a friend of mine, uh, the piano player that was playing with me at, at Nokia. What's his name? Cameron Graves, the, mm -hmm. the licensing guy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, we were just full fledged John Coltrane heads. So we were just, we now, were wild, and we were in this high school jazz band, and we were like going out there, go all the way out, yeah, <laughs> with yeah. double time stuff, and take long solos, and yeah, completely change the chord changes and drive the band director crazy. What, what what is the? How do you go into like? Where do you start with Coltrane? What what like like outside of just you know knowing you play sax and and knowing that that guy was above and beyond anybody? You know wh where do you start to understand what he's doing? You know, it's almost like I needed to have, I because my dad was trying to get me into Coltrane when I was young, and uh -huh. I didn't, I didn't get it. I didn't even like it. I was like, this is weird. Right. It's almost you have to like have a bit of a musical foundation. Right. Train is so emotional. Uh huh. That if if your mind can't, if you can't wrap your mind around what he's doing, then all that emotion just feels crazy. Right. So what's the trick of improvising like that? Landing is letting go. Yeah. It's almost like 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 what what like Bird and all those other guys that they they ran to the edge of the 
edge of the cliff. Yeah. And they would, they may have one pinky toe left on the cliff. Right. But they would always run to the edge and stop. Right. Like with train, you gotta be able to run and jump off. Uh huh. And, and just be okay falling down this cliff and have the confidence <laughs> that somehow I'm going to land on my feet. So it is about landing. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, cause, cause you're going to have to re-enter, right? Yeah. Like at some point, the trick to that type of improvisation jazz wise is like when all of a sudden you look at the drummer and the bass guy and go, okay, I'm back. Yeah. Exactly. Or they can sense it. Yeah. They can sense it. Uh huh. It's like we all jumped off. Yeah. Right. We're all like, where are we going to land? We all like point, look at that. There's a tree. We can land on that tree. Let's yeah. go land on the tree. <laughs> we got to make it to the tree. And, you know, that's, that's, that's. What we so do. you started experimenting with that like at 14 or 15? Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I stayed there until I was about, <laughs> I was still probably still there. <laughs> yeah. But, but, uh, I mean, no, nah, I mean, after that, I mean, I, I was stuck on that for a while. Yeah. And like that was like what we were, we, we, we were all on that. Too. So what were you playing in like a uh, four piece? We had a quartet called the, the Young Jazz Giants. Uh huh. And we terrorized all the jazz clubs of LA. <laughs> we would show up in numbers and just, and, you know, play the songs extra long. And, <laughs> and were that, were the people that were running the place or the, uh, the patrons like, who are these kids? Oh man, everybody. We used to, we used to go to places and sneak in. I, it, we used to go to hear Kenny Garrett. Like the first time we, I met Chris Dave, we yeah. had to go hear Kenny Garrett and Chris Dave was playing drums with him. And mind you, we never met Chris Dave before ever. And so we all walk in there. None of us have any money. Yeah. And we're like, yeah, we're on Chris Day's list. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next day we come in, we're like, we're on Kenny Garrett's list. We didn't know Kenny. We, we would just do it every day. We would go places and just, that was like our thing. Like, we're going to get in. So there was a big, there was a big jazz club uh, scene. There still is one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah, there was the Merc part. And especially when I, I, I got a car, I was the first one to get a car. When I got yeah. a car. We were all over the city. We would go. Like, I don't know anything about that world. So there's still like, you know, jazz going on every yeah. night in Los Angeles. Yeah. 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 There's still jazz going like on. Like real shit. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a, it's such a, a unique and somewhat insulated world, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. And you, you kind of like, I imagine jazz musicians kind of know of each other. Yeah. Especially in the city. Yeah. Like, you know, when a new guy's coming up, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Or when somebody moves in town. Yeah. It's like, it was like a ripple goes through the, <laughs> through the scene. Like, Who's this guy? Yeah. Hey, what's he it's got? Like, it was like a new guy that came out of the Matrix. You know what I mean? Like somebody woke up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So when did you start learning about, uh, you know, like classical music and, and the sort of layering that, you know, that would lead up to, to something like the epic? When did you start putting that stuff together? When I got to Hamilton, I, um, I, all of a sudden, I, they had an orchestra. Yeah. They had a wind ensemble. You know, I was taking piano. I was taking, I was like, I was at, I was in jazz band. Yeah. I was in wind ensemble. I was in orchestra. How are you at and the I piano? Good. The piano. I was pretty good. Yeah. So I was like, had four music classes in high school. Right. You know? Yeah. That was mostly what you were doing. Yeah. How was the other, <laughs> how was the other stuff going? I was, I, I'm a pretty good, I was pretty good at, in school. I yeah. Mean, I was like, you know, my mom is a science teacher, so I was, she always was pushing me on, on that level. And, and I always had, I always had an affinity for learning. Yeah. So I, I was, I was pretty good in school, actually. Yeah, that's good. So you started playing in the orchestra and you could read music from a very early age. Yeah. So that wasn't that, that daunting to you. No, no, but it was different. It was because yeah. it was like that, you know, it was a, I never played in the orchestra before. So it was a different way of playing. Right. You know? Not, not as a expressive per se. And you got to be part of a, yeah. A, a team. Yeah. In yeah. a way. Yeah. yeah you and have 78 bars of rest and then this really important part that you play. So it was like. <laughs> You're waiting. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of waiting. Yeah. 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 And what did you take from, uh, when, when you started to, I imagine like, I don't know jazz structure, but you know, I mean, I imagine that the basics, you know, coming out of Coltrane and, and, and bebop and stuff, yeah, there, there, there's a set of basics that yeah. you're going to, you're going to run with and break and do whatever you want. But I imagine once you get to classical music, you're like, what the, what is this world? Yeah. Yeah. It was that. Yeah. They, they wanted me to play with a different kind of tone on um, the sax. Yeah. Yeah. It was the first time I was really reading music that had really crazy odd meters. Like, you know, we're going to play in, 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 in 17, 16. <laughs> I'm like, what, why? Okay. <laughs> but you could do it. You, you could, could wrap do, yeah, your brain yeah, around yeah, it. I don't yeah. even know what that would be. What, what would that be? It means that there's each measure has 17 six notes, in, 16th notes in it. Like most, it, it's, that, it was ridiculous stuff, stuff like that. Like, so, but, but the cool part of it that was, yeah. that, as I was meeting these classical musicians, right, who were giving me albums, like people were giving me, oh, check out the Rite of Spring. Oh, here, check out this, you know, Prokofiev's Romeo and Juliet. And like this stuff was like, 
really opening my mind up to the, to, to to just different worlds of music, you know. Right. So just like you were with Blakey, you got these people that are like yeah. that with uh, with Mozart or yeah. whoever. Yeah, yeah. So like when you started listening to that stuff, you know, what what was the difference for you in in like you know if you got somebody like Coltrane taking you out there over the cliff, you know, looking to land. You know what? What was your first impression of what those classical composers were doing? Well, they were doing the same because I, I I was into the out composers. I was into like Stravinsky. So Stravinsky is like writing this music that's so dense and so like heavy that uh-huh. it, it it could stand right up next to what Train was doing. Oh, right, right. So it was like I was like, oh wow. So the other people that had the same kind of intensity and energy that like I like over here. This yeah, it's over here too. And it's old. It's old. Yeah, and, yeah. And yeah. It, it really made me want to start writing. I was like, oh man, like this is, I'm into this, you yeah, know. That was what inspired you to kind of like start composing. Yeah. Like, yeah. uh, like with discipline. Yeah. As yeah. opposed to just riffing. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was already kind of like writing little tunes and jazz, but I was like, man, I, I want to learn. Like, so like by the time I was done with high school, I knew when I, when I went to college, I wanted to learn how to write for the orchestra. I, Cause I was just like, man, that would be. And did you feel like it was, cause I know when you're working with a quartet that there's like a, a one mind trust thing. That you're you're kind of reading each each other's signals and and knowing the feel of the music, but when you're working with an orchestra and you've got a, a conductor, you know, keeping the pace, and you know you have to honor this piece. That collaboration is very different than than working with a quartet, yeah, right? Yeah. So you're you're kind of part of this like giant body. Yeah, yeah. It's, and it's interpretation as opposed to um, create. It's like me to, to creation, right? Improvisation. You know it's, it's like there's still a bit of there's still the same there's still a connection you have to make and you still you still have to be creative in a way but yeah your, your creativity is is coming through in, in how you interpret the music so what makes uh any one orchestras or any one conductors um different uh in terms of it, it's how they approach or or pace the music or, yeah, or how they pace the music how they how they phrase it yeah it's kind of like subtlety more subtle subtle differences but you can subtle. tell but you can tell yeah yeah and it can change i mean the tempo of a song can completely change the whole feel of it and like, like right how because a lot of classical music also had a lot of music that was like the the tempo is is is, is much freer right so it's like the music kind of like has this kind of like elastic time feel to it. Oh wow. So it's like it's moving in this way that's not so set where like as jazz is like Yeah. And you have to like lock yeah. into this groove yeah. a lot of the time. Yeah. I mean also there's also jazz that has that similar thing, but like in classical music there was a lot of this elasticity. Right. And it's like how are you gonna play this? And right. Like, how are you phrasing it? And so it's it's subtle. But it's also part of a bigger arc. Yeah. Right? Like if you're playing a symphony, I mean you're in for a while. Yeah, yeah. And I guess some of that must have informed the 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 structure of the epic in a way, right? You oh, see yeah. this as one piece, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's like that's directly relatable to classical that you have that flow and that elasticity, but it's honoring the story or the arc of the symphony. Yeah, yeah. Wow, man, this is good. I'm learning. So, <laughs> so where'd you go to college? Uh, I went to UCLA, and you studied only music. Uh, I studied ethnomusicology and and composition. Oh, so that must have been mind blowing. And jazz studies. So I was like, I was all over the place. I was like playing in a jazz band. I was, I was taking ethnomusicology classes and I was taking composition classes. So you got a degree in ethnomusicology? Yep. Now, what did that introduce you to? So I, I'm assuming that that means that you're dealing with, um, indigenous music from everywhere. Well, just music from all over the places. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's, uh, we were studying like North Indian classical music. We were studying, North Indian classical music? Yeah. What does that even mean? Like stuff, people like Robbie Shankar. Oh, okay. Like, that's considered classical music. Yeah. That's good to know. I just got a Shankar record. Yeah. Yeah. That live yeah. in 71 at his house. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So like people like Robbie Shankar and like Ali Akbar Khan and like this. So you had to learn about the structure of that, of the ragas and the... yeah, and the scales and 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 this, their whole way approach of listening to music and, and 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 hearing and like their whole approach to music. What other stuff? What other type um, of music? Was I was listening. To, so I got exposed to this music called uh, gamelan music, which is from uh, Indonesia. Really? And it's all based off these astinados. So they 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 create like they may go like da di da da da, and like so one person will play it slow, and someone else will go ba di da da, and someone else will go. Da, de, da, da, yeah. da, de. So, and it, yeah, all these layers yeah, yeah. create these really amazing kind of like textures and harmony. So it was like, I was learning that kind of stuff. It's was, like almost trance-like, just even you doing those two. Yeah. Oh, like, man, you get 
caught up in it and then they put a melody on top of that. And, yeah, yeah. You know, so I was learning that and I was listening to like, you know, there was like these, uh, these, these Irish boy choirs that like had these really crazy textures and there was just music from all over the world. I mean, I was listening to some music, like some Native American music that like you almost couldn't even recognize it as music. But, right. <laughs> so, but it had a function and, 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 and it, and it really just opened me up to the, to the reality that there's anything was possible. Like even like the, the North Indian classical music, one of the things that was crazy to me is that, you know, those songs all last like two, three hours long, like one, right, one joint. And like yeah. the people love it. And yeah. I was like, oh man. So we have like this, we, we think we can only do three minutes. And they're doing three hours. <laughs> so anything is really possible. You know what I mean? And also I think like, you know, I, I, I've sort of thought my, and I, and I've talked a little bit about before is that, you know, music really is sort of magic. Yeah. You, you know, like it's not like spoken word, you know, where, where language has, you know, so much power. And it's not like what I do, like stand up comedy where, you know, you're waiting for a turn of a phrase to get closure, but music, you can actually enchant people and you can do it over and over again, even with the same piece of music. Like, you know, there's nothing like, you know, like you can listen to the same piece of music over and over again at different points of your life. And either it'll take you back or it'll take you where it took you or it'll take you a new place. Yeah. And I always thought that. Did you feel that initially when you're getting into Coltrane that there's a personal journey? That yeah, it was yeah. not necessarily like a shared experience outside of the guys you're playing with. Yeah, well, I think it's, it's more. It's almost like it's a um, it's a conversation. Okay. It's like I feel like like music is, is communication like beyond your control. It's right. Like, it's like I'm going to strip away all of my no knowledge, uh -huh. and I'm my core is going to kind of is going to communicate with your core. Right. And like so that's what happens. So like you hear Coltrane, it's like you hear his core communicating with McCoy Tyner's. Who's communicating with Elvin Jones and Jimmy Garrison? So yeah. they're, they're all communicating, and as a listener, you're kind of like you you're receiving, and it's this how open you are is how much of it you can receive. That's why I think like it's like almost an infinite. It's like you can. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, the big cane. <laughs> you can uh you can receive a lot or you can receive a little. Right. And like so, I, like I find that like over over the years, like I have a piece of music and I like I hear it and like. I'm sometimes I'm hearing a whole nother part of it that I never even realized was there. Right. You know, but well, I, I have that experience with your record. Like every time I put it on, because there's so much going on that, you know, like you can sort of like move your, 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 your listening to different elements of it. Yeah. Like they're all sort of carrying you through, but, but you're sort of like, you know, if I, like I got locked into that choral stuff. I'm like, what's, what is that? What is going on? <laughs> and then you kind of shift over and you got two keyboards going. Right. Yeah, yeah. And then it's sort of like, oh my God, like it's mind blowing. Just the, the, the event of it. Yeah. 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 You know, and then when I saw you do a live, I'm like, I don't know if I can take it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's an interesting way to put it because if a musician is doing his job or doing his art that, you know, w when he's done, uh, if it's recorded, you know, you walk away thinking like, well, it's all there. You know, I did it. I did my part. So what anyone else is going to do, it's really on them. Yeah, yeah. And that's sort of like that's sort of what jazz is. It's yeah. like people who are like, I don't get it. And then if you're like, well, maybe you just sit with it longer. It's like, oh, kind of getting it. And then all of a sudden you're like, holy shit! Yeah, yeah. that's the best. Yeah, that that's the best that can happen. Yeah, right. That's why you you rarely hear someone say like, yeah, when I was younger, I was into jazz, but I don't like it anymore. <laughs> but that's not you know. It's like once you but, get it, it's one of those things that because it's so wide. So now let's talk about the epic because it is definitely something to be reckoned with. And like what, what I was really excited and impressed about it, about the record was that, cause I listen to jazz, but like I said, you know, I, I'm not in any way, like I got a jazz encyclopedia over there and look at the size <laughs> of that book and that's 15 years old. And it's like, yeah, how, what, how am I ever going to even tap that shit? It's quite crazy. I'm like, you know what? I got to go listen to 90 Zoot Sims records to understand anything. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> so when I put this on and I couldn't stop listening to, it, like I, you got, you want to listen to the whole thing, and it's not like I can remember all the melodies and stuff, but I, I was completely compelled the whole time. And when I look at, like, this is what happens with jazz a lot. You look at the titles and you're like, well, this, this, this got to mean something because it's, <laughs> there's, a, there's a volume one, a volume two, and a volume three, and they all got titles. <laughs> 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 so there's a whole other level that I may never get to access. So what was the plan? So the plan, so those three different albums are like three different parts of my life. So I want, I wanted the album to kind of like be a, a, a example of who I was. Mm -hmm. So the plan, like that, that whole time period I told you about, we, we were young and we were like, 
so intense on yeah. like becoming like we read a joke saying like nobody's like I want to be huge and jazz, but we really did. <laughs> you wanted to be what? We want. I mean, we wanted to be great. Yeah. And we thought that we we were gonna we were in high school. We yeah. really believed that we had figured out a music that was going to make people understand jazz. Right. Because our friends did. So I, we all had we all grew up in the hood. And we had regular regular extra not deep. 40 drinking, weed smoking, you know, yeah. regular people friends. Yeah. And we, I, we, we used to convert them into jazz heads. Uh huh. And it was like, they would love our music. They would come to our shows at the world stage and be like into it. Like yeah. these really extra hood people. So we yeah. were like, man, we are playing a music that we can like. Yeah. We're going to save yeah. jazz. <laughs> or, 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 we're going to, we're going to, we're going to like, we're going to save the world. We're going to bring the world to jazz and everybody's yeah. going to like, minds are going to be open and expanded and like, yeah, yeah. So we were, we were working really hard. We were practicing every day, yeah. eight, nine hours a day. We we're going to every jam session, like I said, every concert, even though we didn't have any money. Yeah. We didn't care. If you came to LA, we were going to be at your show. Right. Even if you had, if one time we, we were out of gas and we had to ask, uh, 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 we had to ask one of the guys, we had to ask, ask him for some gas money to get home. Oh, yeah, <laughs> we yeah. come to your show and ask for money. <laughs> <laughs> and you got, and what are they going to say? It's like, we came. Yeah. 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 You know, I don't see a lot of people here. <laughs> <laughs> so like, we were determined to do that. And then yeah. like, what happened is out of high school, so that's, that was the plan. And that music, yeah. a lot of that music actually, plan. like, was, is, is either from that time period or it's music that I wrote thinking about that time period, you know? And then the glorious tale. The, the second Taylor record is like after high school, like we got out of high school and we all ended up on gigs that were not jazz gigs. Yeah. <laughs> so Where'd you end up? I ended up playing with Snoop. Yeah. You know, Thundercat was playing with Suicidal Tendencies. You know, um, Brandon, Brandon was playing with, uh, um, Brian McKnight, you know, um, um, but Mom, so you were just working for a living. Yeah. We were all on tour with these yeah. really big artists that we really respected. What were you doing with Snoop? I was playing horns. Playing oh, yeah. Horn section. Yeah. On the road. That was fun, huh? Yeah, it was super fun. And, and I learned a lot musically and as far as life too. I learned a lot. So it was important for me. So it was like, it was almost like, but I remember we, we were all thinking in our minds, like, when are we going to do that thing that we, yeah, when are we going to save the world? Yeah, when are we going to save the world? And so for years and years, we were just, but the opportunities were so cool and there were artists that were so cool that like, but you all must have been learning different things. Like, yeah. what'd you, what'd you take from the experience with Snoop? Um, like, so Snoop, when I, when I, when I, when I first got in Snoop's band, like, the first thing I realized was that, like, their whole approach to music was different. Yeah. Like, they were hearing things in music that I wasn't even hearing. Like, so what? They, so they'd tell me, they tell me to play a line. They tell me to go, like, shut up, butt up. Yeah. Bow. And I go, I play that. I go, butt up, butt up, bow. And they go, nope. Shut up, butt up, bow. <laughs> yeah. And I'd play butt up, butt up. Bow. And they go, nope, that's not it. Cause I'm, I'm just placing a note ever so slightly. Oh, really? And like my phrasing is ever so much different. And yeah. so I was like, Oh, you really are hearing the microscopic differences. Like, the, like, like they hear music almost like, you know, most people hear music like they're hearing this. Right. And they're hearing like, they're hearing like, yeah, 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 yeah. So hearing the music chopped up in these little bitty, 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 bitty pieces. Right. And if you're not in the exact right spot with these little bitty, bitty pieces, yeah. And if your phrasing and your tone and everything else is not exactly right to them, you played it wrong. <laughs> and I'm like, so I had to, I, so I started hearing music like this. Like I was starting to really pay attention to like, where, where, where do you want me to play this? How yeah. do you want me to play this? And like, I would really listen to how exactly you want me to do it. Mm -hmm. And like where you exactly wanted me to put stuff. And it was kind of like the thing of church where like you have to really, you have to feel it. Yeah. 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 To understand what you're missing. And he's you like know? one of those dudes that definitely has his own groove. Yeah. He has his own groove and he's like, they're aware of it. It's not like, it, I mean, they don't, they don't necessarily verbalize it. Right. But they're hyper aware of it. Like, so if you're not like locked into that, that, that special thing, place, yeah. you know what I mean? It's like, so you, then you're whack. Yeah. You could play a hundred, you could play giant steps at, 400 BPMs. Yeah. They don't care. <laughs> Can you play bow right there and play it like there every single time? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so, you know, I kind of expanded my mind and like the, the how the, the importance of like the subtleties of music. Uh huh. You know, and, and you didn't, never thought you'd learn that from Snoop, right? No, nah, no. Nah. <laughs> and it made me appreciate to be able to play jazz. So like we were on tour with Snoop and we get off the stage playing with 60,000 people and we were in a, like, cause there was a couple of us that were jazz musicians. Yeah. A lot of us were jazz musicians. Yeah. And we'd be like on a hunt for a jam session. Yeah. And we show up in our Snoop uniforms because we had to wear khakis, chucks, yeah. or like a, you know, like a jailhouse t-shirt or yeah. something. And we walk in there and they look at us like, 
Uh, what are you guys gonna do? Yeah, and we play giant steps and blow them all away, and they'd be like, "What? What is? What is going on here?" Like, and so we th- we we like doing that too. So it was that's like, fun, man. So it was like you know now so you, go, you get to a town, you'd be like, "Where's the jazz, man? Yeah, we're, we're done with Snoop. Where can we go to blow this out?" Yeah, yeah, and they would look at us like. Yeah. What, do you, what do you want to play? You want yeah. to play Sugar or something like yeah, that? Yeah. Like, no, no, no. Let's let's play Countdown. <laughs> and they'd be like, Countdown? You know what uh, I mean? Like, they like... All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so, it's too bad you weren't videoing all this. Oh, thing. yeah. It would have been funny. It would have been funny. Because, like, I can tell you that people, I mean, almost every time they would look at us like... You got nothing. You don't know how to play that. Yeah, 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 yeah. We were like, we loved it too, because we were, we were, we were at the at sound check, <laughs> backstage. All, all we were doing was playing, you know, playing Eternal Triangle and just shedding every yeah, day. Yeah. It was like I yeah. practiced probably more on the roll with Snoop than I did <laughs> right. with, with with Stanley Clark. Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Because you're in it with Stanley Clark. Yeah, yeah. And when you're with Snoop, you're just making sure you still got it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was. Uh, I learned a lot, you know, and so and, and, and so. For years, I, we just kept going from one, and so it was almost like you guys were becoming pros, is what you were doing. Yeah, and so then that that second part is you guys coming back together. That second part is that whole time period, basically, when you were apart from each other. Yeah, 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 and yeah. Like I wrote a lot of those songs on the road with Snoop, and like uh-huh. it's, it's about that, like that want to get back. Right, right, and right. And then the third part, the, um, the historical repetition, is basically like when I'm when, when we went in to record this, it was 2011. Yeah, and, and I just had a revelation. Just reflecting on, like, a lot of us are second generation musicians. Yeah. And I, I just saw how a lot of our fathers, like, basically did that. Like, they got their talented and kind of got wrapped up into using their talents to help someone else, basically. Yeah. And kind of neglected their own music. The vision. Yeah. And right. so, like, we, we all kind of came to this place and we were like, we got to do our own thing. We got to do it. Like, it can't be next year. We got to do it. Like, right. We got to do it. Like, right. And so we basically quit all of our gigs for a whole month. Right. Which is hard to do. Right. Like people were like, well, you, you can't do what? Yeah. I can't do anything for, for in December. Yeah. Why? Because I'm recording my own music. Why do you need a whole month? Because <laughs> I'm not just recording my music. I'm recording his music and his music and his music too. So yeah. it was like, it was a hard thing to do, but we did it. Yeah. And I, and I was just, I was, that, that whole part, that rec, that part of the record is just my, my, my homage to learning from the past. Wow. You know what I mean? Yeah. So the, so you would say the third record is the pure new stuff. Well, no, the third record is really, it's my, it's a reverse. Uh-huh. It's like moving forward in the future. Yeah. Through understanding the past. Oh, right. So and the whole thing. Yeah. That's, that's about. So that's why I like, I'm taking the past and moving it forward. So I, I like all the old songs that we do, we flip them. Like we play Cherokee and we completely flipped it. We yeah. Yeah. Play yeah. Claire de Luna and we completely trip flip it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah. Like learning from like Malcolm's thing is like what I learned from reading his books and stuff yeah. like that. And, even rerun is like I took the song that we had already did and like I'm learning from myself as well. Right. Like looking back to where I was in the plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know what I mean? So yeah. it's, 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 that's, that was the whole that's so this, the energy of that record. So this is a full life record. Yeah. <laughs> right here. Yeah. Now these when you talk about we, you're saying that all the cats that are on this are, are the guys that you've been with for a long time. Yeah, yeah. All, we all grew up together. Like I met I met Ron on Thundercat when I was three years old. Uh, Ronald's dad and my dad had a band together. And yeah. So when I was three, I was a drummer. Yeah. And I got a drum set. And so, uh, out the, I was at the party and like, uh, I was playing my drums yeah. and ever. And Ronald Bruno Sr. showed up. And I knew Ronald Bruno Sr., but I don't think I ever met his kids. They were like little, they were little, they were younger than me. Yeah. So like Ronald Bruno Jr. was like this little baby. Yeah. He was like one. Yeah. He couldn't talk. Right. I swear he couldn't talk, man. Yeah. And he got up and he played the drums like a, like literally like a 13 year old <laughs> right. he was one and i was like <laughs> what? he was like way better to be i was like what the heck is, what is this <laughs> we got a, we got a, we got a set up this is my birthday <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah 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 now what's the uh what's the deal with this kendrick fella oh man he's a real live genius <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know um i like his records i listen to two of the records i haven't listened to the newest one yet my girlfriend's a huge fan and like I'm not a huge like hip hop dude, you know, so like I got to really pay attention. And uh, he, he definitely has his own time zone, that guy. Oh yeah. And he, you, how do you know him? Through uh, Terrace Martin, uh-huh. another guy I grew up with. Yeah. Um, yeah, but he's a saxophone player. He grew, yeah. up, he grew up with this playing jazz. Yeah. And this that, that same band, the Motor School Jazz Band, that we were yeah, yeah. all in. He was in that band, and um, so um, he had a he has a record that came out called Velvet Portraits. It was really really dope. Okay. And so I was working on that record with him. Yeah. And he heard about, this is like in 
This is in 2000. This is like before the epic came out. So mm-hmm. he'd heard about it, but he hadn't heard it. Right. So I played him, played him a record. And when he heard it, he was like, Oh man, I got something I need you to do. Yeah. For Kendrick's record. Yeah. And I was like, Oh, okay. So I, I, you know, I was he I, producing it or something? Yeah. He's producing it. Yeah. And so he took me in and like, they played me the record and I was like blown away. And I, at first I was just supposed to work on that song, Mortal Man. Yeah. Like that, 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 that skit that happened after it. Yeah. But it was like every time they played a the record, someone was like, Oh, you should put something on this too. <laughs> <laughs> and that, yeah, and that. So I mean, the end of it, I ended up playing a lot, doing yeah, a lot, yeah, doing a lot, uh, uh, doing a lot of stuff for the record. But, um, do you help do any of the arrangements? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what I was, I was, I was, I was mainly doing. I was mainly doing string, string arrangements. String oh yeah, arrangements. and so yeah. you added that whole layer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it was. That was amazing because I, I was I was there and like and you didn't know Kendrick before. I, I know I knew of him, but I didn't. I, ne- I never met him. Uh huh. I never met him, and um. You know, the, the amazing thing that I, I, I was really struck first, first off was that he was so hands on. Yeah. So like first day one, like, like, okay, Kamasi, write some stuff to this. So I'm like, okay, you want to give me the files? I'll go home and come back. And they're like, no, <laughs> you got to write this here. <laughs> you, know, you don't get to leave with anything. Yeah. So I was like, oh, okay, wow. So I like, I had like some manuscript paper. So I'm just kind of sitting there listening to the music and I have like a little piano set up and I'm sitting there writing and Kendrick is just sitting on the couch watching. <laughs> yeah. And, and it was, but it wasn't like a vibe of like, let me make sure you don't do anything I want you to do. It's more like, I'm just curious to see like how, how you, this process works. Yeah. And I was like, wow. I mean, most artists, you don't even meet them. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, you just yeah. do it and then yeah. you mess around and be at the Grammys. Like, hey. Yeah. Good job. I wrote some stuff on your record. Yeah. I, or I'll play on your record. And you're like, oh, like, oh, really? Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> oh, really? Is that this thing? <laughs> yeah. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah. So he was so hands on. And then I would see him do superhuman stuff. Like, like one time, Terrace. Brought it, brought in a new, a new beat. Yeah. And I saw Kendrick just create a whole song while he was hearing it for the first time. And it felt like a complete song. I was like, did you just create that right now? Yeah. Like while I was sitting here, like as you were listening to it for the first time, uh huh. I was like, wow, man, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? So he's got that thing yeah. that you got from jazz and you got from Coltrane that, you know, yeah. that the sort of, uh, Tapping into the spirit yeah. and being in the moment yeah. and moving through it. Yeah. And he's got it. He's got it full fledged. You know? Yeah, yeah. And so and it was, and he's also got the got the the spirit of, of, of music in that he understands that like you know, the best music you're gonna get from someone is is who they are. Yeah. You know? Right. So he would really let you do whatever you wanted to do. Like it was like he wasn't I was I felt completely free to right. do what I wanted to do when you know, it's like put some strings on this. I'm like, okay. And so, like, they kept, you know, you usually got to, like, do something really simple and you try to sneak a little cool thing in Yeah, there. yeah. And it was like, nah, man. Go. Do go. Yeah. I was like, four-part harmony? Go. Five-part harmony? <laughs> go. <laughs> Six-part harmonies? <laughs> you know? And I was like, you know, it was yeah, like, yeah. we were just like, I was like, all right, you sure I, you sure I can go this far in? And like, yeah, yeah, yeah go. Go. Yeah. So I was like, oh, wow, this is really cool. You don't get to work like this. And that was a huge record. Yeah, it's a huge record. And, and was, that's the to, to Pimp a Butterfly. Yes. And it's such a beautiful and I, I have to say, I mean, like when I came in, they'd already created this beautiful thing. Yeah. And like I felt honored that they wanted me to I was like, What the hell you want me to do? This is already so good. Yeah. And they're like, nah, we hear something that you could do to this. And I was yeah. like, Wow. And I was I was blown away that, that to I was honored to be a part of it. Right. Know? And that's true collaboration. Yeah. Like see, that's the interesting thing. I think it, I, I imagine you, you recognize in yourself that the evolution from you know the 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 original band, the Giants of the mod, what is it? The Modern Giants of what was the first? Your first oh, young, oh, Young Jazz Giants. The Young Jazz Giants. The evolution outside of your own skill and your own ability to open your creativity was the ability to really collaborate on a big level. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, like, you know, when you're you know doing arrangements for you know the the basically the small orchestra you put together for the epic. That, you know, the, the trust and the, that conversation you're talking about just gets bigger and bigger. And so when you work with someone like Kendrick, I imagine where they're like, we trust you. Yeah. You're a real guy. Do, yeah. do what you do. Yeah, that, that, exactly. that level of collaboration is rare and it's great. Yeah, yeah. It's beautiful. What are you working on now? Um, I have a new record. I'm about to start, um, next month, actually. I'm, 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 I'm right now organizing in my mind, like, what I'm going to try. Cause I have so much music. So I have to kind of like pick, like, who, yeah, yeah. Who, who gets the, who gets the hit today? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so like, um, same crew, same crew. I have some other people that I want to involve in it too. There's some young guys I've been exposed to uh-huh. recently that are like young guys. How old are you? 
Oh, well, they're young, like 17. Oh, okay. So. <laughs> 17, 18. They, they call me Mr. Washington and stuff like that. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, yeah, I can come play, but you gotta stop calling me Mr. Washington. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was great talking to you, and thank you for uh, for spending the time and, and educating me a little bit. And... Oh, man, thank you for, for, for inviting me, man. Let, let me hang out with the mushroom. And yeah, <laughs> you got it. Yeah, Kamasi, Washington. That was exciting for me. I, I, don't, I like learning things, and I like talking to artists. That's what I like to do. Hey, before uh, I talk to, uh, to Ben Ratliff, the former New York Times jazz critic was sponsored today by Audible, which is great for everyone out there who loves to read but can never seem to find the time. With Audible, get everything you want to read as audiobooks and listen to them anytime, at the gym, during your commute, you name it. Audible.com has more than 180,000 titles from books, magazines, newspapers, audio broadcasts, and more. And their free app works on just about every device. And Audible.com also has the great listen guarantee. If you decide you don't like the book you choose, you can exchange it for another title anytime, no questions asked. Let's go to Audible right now and put jazz right there in the search bar. Um, The Jazz of Physics, the secret link between music and the structure of the universe. I should read these books. Jazz, a history of America's music. I should. That's narrated by LeVar Burton. Look at this. Elements of jazz from cakewalks to fusion. Maybe that'll turn me around on the fusion. Anyway, you get the point. For WTF listeners, audible.com is offering a free 30 day trial membership. Go to audible.com slash WTF to start your free trial today. That's a free 30 day trial at audible.com slash WTF. All right. Let's jazz it up some more. Now, Ben Ratliff is a jazz critic. He's a guy who writes on jazz. His recent book, Every Song Ever, 20 Ways to Listen in an Age of Musical Plenty, is available wherever you buy books. He's also written books about the most important jazz records. He's written a book on uh, John Coltrane, which I'm trying to, to get. But I had an opportunity to talk to him, and he was out here, and I wanted to learn. I wanted to learn about jazz, but, you know, he's a good guy, and I learned about also the life of a critic and what compels somebody towards uh towards that gig so this is me and former new york times jazz critic ben ratliff where do you live i live in the bronx really yeah. all the way up there yeah well you got a house up there like past uh a, an apartment uh-huh uh just in the in the northwest bronx just, yeah just into the bronx right it's it's Riverdale, right? Riverdale, that's and, it. Yeah, and and Riverdale has a has a uh, a part with big houses yeah. near the river, right? And, and a part with you know normal stuff. Yeah, and I'm in the the normal area. Yeah, you've been there a long time. Uh, no, just a couple of years. Oh yeah, but yeah. you've been a New York guy yeah, forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where where'd you grow up? There. I grew up in well, born in New York City. Yeah, lived in London briefly because my my dad worked there my mom was english really and then yeah and then rockland county north of new york city yeah. most of the time yeah growing up and then and then i went to columbia columbia that's what did it that's what sealed the deal kind of yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i'm gonna be a new well, york guy well i mean you lived in new yeah. york you, yeah did you know that columbia has like the greatest uh radio station in the world no yeah and it, and and the programming then yeah. at least maybe still now is about sixty percent jazz. Mm -hmm. So as, as a student, you could go in there and uh, you encounter these huge lockers full of records. Yeah, and that's like in 1985. Yeah, that, that was the internet. Yeah, you know? right. The box, the room full of records. Yeah. So you know you do so you do what everybody does like. You, you you figure out what you know, yeah, and then you work backwards. Right, the three things you know, yeah. and then you keep going like, oh fuck, yeah, what's this? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, what led up to the tiny amount that I know? Right, and then you put it all together. Because I think that way. Like right. I I have when I have uh, someone in here who's a musician, and I know that it's not going to make a difference, but I'll I'll buy every one of their albums, even if there's twenty. You and know, I'll sit there and you, do that. You know that it's not going to make a difference whether you know a little about the musician's work or a lot? Well, I know that ultimately, you know, how I'm going to take it in when I do that. Like, I don't have a yeah. lot of time. Yeah. You know, and, and, I don't, and I don't necessarily, I think, arguably, 
uh, in that respect, research wise, put the time necessary into into sort of really doing the lifelong. In my mind, it's like, well, if I'm going to sit down with Neil Young, I got a lot of fucking yeah. work to do. Yeah. But what you don't know is Neil might not want to talk about shit. Right. That's right. <laughs> so, That's right. and you know, he, he might only want to talk about one thing. And your entry point, whatever that is, even if it's limited, right, that was earnest, means a lot. That's right. You know. That's right. I mean, it's that. That's it's really authentic. Right. But you know, you don't want to do a disservice to the freaks out there no. that are sort of like, what he didn't talk about Zuma. Ah, there's freaks everywhere, right? I know. I mean, I know pedants. Yes. You know, <laughs> I, 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 I know, but what you want to do is at least give them something. Yeah. And th what I learned over time was that, you know, if I get him in here and he talks about his truck. Yeah. You know, that's going to be more exciting for the nerds than if he get, they <laughs> right. get. Okay, sure. So you want to, you want to create something of value to the well, people. Well, who just really so care. they're like, I didn't even know he had a truck and I've been <laughs> listening to him for 60 years. Yeah. Whatever it is. Yeah. But I like this idea that like what, like, cause you've been a, a, a what would you call yourself? A music critic mm -hmm. for a long time. You've been mm -hmm. at the New York Times for what, for 20 years yes. over more than 20 years? 20 years. 20 years exactly. Yes. Yeah. So you're in, you're, you're following in big shoes as far mm -hmm. as, you know, New York jazz music reviewers. Like I, does Hentoff loom large? Mm -hmm. Right. Sure. Uh, I don't know a lot of the other ones, but him is like, mm -hmm. he seems to be the guy. Sure. For years, Nat Hentoff. And, and very present to me too, as a writer, he, he would call up sometimes and, 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 say, and say he liked something. Uh -huh. And he could only be reached by telephone. Mm -hmm. No, no internet. Or oh anything. yeah. Did he pass? Is he? No, he's still around. He's still around. Yeah, so you yeah. still get, what are they cranky calls? Are they like, no. I think it's a misread. No. 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 Really he's good. A, oh really? Yeah. <laughs> Was he a mentor of sorts? No. No. You no, won't no, give just, him that. Just a distant, very positive presence. Uh, oh, that's nice yeah, though. Yeah. Like uh, it's history because yeah. he was a definer in a lot of ways, right? Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, he um he wrote books about jazz. He also wrote tons and tons of of liner notes, mm -hmm. you know, on right. like really important records. Yeah. He was in the studio with people he he really got to know people like Coltrane. Right. And, you know. Um so his writing must have been of some value to you. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a whole other issue. I mean, I, I guess I'm so I'm such a like sentence guy uh -huh. um rather than a historian uh -huh. or uh, or a um or somebody who wants to help the consumer decide what record to buy right. like i actually love sentences and so i guess i pay it close attention to people's prose uh -huh. you know uh -huh. and i i mean i guess i get more sometimes i get more juice out of people that i can apply to my own work that aren't writing about music at all. Oh yeah, yeah. So when you say sentence guy, does that mean you're you're more like? Because in this in your new book, you're sort of seeking to create a, a new context. Yeah, yeah. Through sure. which people can appreciate music. Right. So like it, that's outside, you know, sort of taking from history the idea that there was a time where there were there were communities and populations that could only listen to one kind of music there was a mainstream music and we all got fed the same type of popular music and there are people that like classical there's just country people but now the idea is that everything is happening all at once with no fucking context yeah so how do you sit with that and be okay with the movement through it that's right so so history obviously gets somewhat short shrift in the new system in a way sure does by by nature yeah but but and when you say that you're a sentence guy over a history guy, does that mean you go with your gut, that it's a feeling thing, that it's poetry? Is that what we're talking about? I think that uh, music criticism mm -hmm. is a really vital thing. You know, it's it's not just a service. It's not something dry. It's something about um, interpreting and almost communing with the the thing you're, you're writing about, the, the music. And respecting it. Yeah, it's a form of respect. Mm -hmm. It is a form of respect. I mean, you could be saying what you don't like about it, but that's still a form of respect that and, you're getting very close to it. Right. And it's it's partially just um the the discipline I came up in, you know, um starting writing about music in the early 90s. Um What were you doing before that? Like let's go back to that that record room. I mean, what yeah. you know, how do you like where, where so you you're in England for a while. You go to Columbia. What were you studying? I studied classics, uh, Latin and Greek. So you're English major or a classics classics major? classics major. So you read Latin. Yeah, you did all that. Yeah. And what'd you what'd you take from that? Well, sentence sentence structure. 
So, <laughs> this is just, where the love of sentences yeah, came from. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we getting really close to, to sentences. <laughs> yeah, and how yeah. sentences work for <laughs> yeah. sure. That and also, I mean, I read a lot of really good literature in Latin and Greek. But then after that, um, I worked in book publishing for six years. Oh, yeah. For who? For um, Little Brown and William Morrow and as Henry, an editor, Henry Holt. Yeah, like a baby editor. Oh, baby editor. He yeah. never you, did. You get disillusioned, or you just um, yes. Uh, and and also at one point, I, I was told directly, you know, you're just not gonna make it here. <laughs> and I was so grateful to hear that. You know, <laughs> it's it's nice when somebody hits you with some honesty. It really is. Right? Yeah. Were you writing at that time? Yes. So but I, you were going to be a novelist, or no, no, I was really interested in like music criticism. Specifically, cultural criticism generally. Like, who were your guys? Like Northrop Fry? Uh, no, um, uh, that was too English majory for me. I mean, I was Ben Hamin. <laughs> yeah, well, Walter Benjamin, pretty, yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I, I guess I really read a lot of sort of like mid twentieth century um, people writing about music, but also writing about other arts, uh -huh. like. Um, Ralph Ellison, Albert Murray, uh, uh, Manny Farber writing uh -huh. about movies, uh -huh. um, Pauline Kael. So you saw criticism, both cultural and art criticism, in 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 the way and making a distinguish distinguishing between a reviewer and a critic. That that through the art, you 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 explore all levels of 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 humanity in a yeah. way. Yeah, that that that's your portal in that that yeah. you respected the form of criticism, which has fallen away a bit uh, culturally in the sense that I, I don't know that people really appreciate it or understand the difference be between like if you say he's a movie critic, be like, well, he reviews movies. Yeah, they don't understand the weight of it. Yeah. Um, my I have an ideal about criticism mm -hmm. just for for what I want to do with it and what yeah. I get out of it, which is like, um. You take something in and you and you are able to isolate the part of it that is maybe essential to it. Mm -hmm. But like if you if you took it out, the whole thing would just kind of crumble. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So you get that little piece, which is representative. Right. And and you describe it as closely as you can. Uh huh. And the description of it becomes a sort of ritual act. Uh huh. You know, and yeah. and you're and by doing that. Again, this is like my ideal version of, yeah, but of, you're, what, of what I do. But you're a real guy, so well, this means something. Every once in a while, I get close to the ideal. Yeah. Most mostly, don't get anywhere near. But um, you know, and then so you know, you all all you can do is you take a representative part of it, describe it, bear down on it like crazy, interpret it, and and somehow the essence of the thing can sort of rise up through the writing. Right. And when and I just feel like that's it. That's that's it. That's all. That's a lot. That's enough. So that's the job right. for me. So in this new book, you you sort of like do that. You compartmentalize that process. Yeah. And then you literally make song lists as examples of your point of essence in each of these different areas that you're using to appreciate music. Yeah, that's kind of it. Yeah. I mean, I guess the book starts with a um a question and then becomes like a meditation on different ways right. of listening. And right. the, the question is like, okay, stop for a minute. Here we are. Um, we have in our pockets, um, not, not every song ever, but, but kind of, it can seem like that. Yeah. You know, it's like as, as close to what people thought about the great library of Alexandria, you know, like, like n not the whole sum of human knowledge ever but but, close. but like it can seem that way mm -hmm. we've got it in our pockets right so like all right so what are we going to do with it yeah um and how can we access that stuff that we all have and are we going to rely on uh streaming services and and uh recommendation engines to to tell us what we like are mm -hmm. we going to kind of give them control over our taste or are we going to figure out ways to get back in you know, reach back into the depths of what's there, and um, or surprise ourselves. Surprise ourselves, and there's always the shuffle option. Yeah, there, sure, and and learn how to encounter something new and not be uh, alienated by it. Learn how to encounter something you've never heard before, and say, "Oh yeah, that is about me also." 
Right. About mm-hmm. me. Mm-hmm. That's the big, that's the big distinguisher. Yeah. That, you know, there is this sort of element of popular music that has always been there that it's designed in its magical structure, uh, to, to grab you and, and make you react somehow. Mm-hmm. And, uh, that's always there. You can't, I mean, it, it's there pretty far back, yeah. right? Yeah. And the hook, the beat, whatever it is, the, the, the time that the, the song came out, this was designed. You know, we want you to write songs to sell songs. Yeah. We're selling songs to people here. Make them dance, make them feel something. But then there's this more of the world of music has none of that intention. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I don't think people realize that. That the I'm, I'm sure they do. But we, you know, even myself, like when I started buying records, you know, I I never knew about like these smaller labels, secondary labels, these home, you know, these kind of like one thousand pressings of some band that disappeared that. That like it was actually a surprise to me. I guess if I really thought about it, I, I would know it. That there was really, there's always mainstream, and then you meet the guy at the record store, and you realize like, oh, there's this other thing. Right. And then you meet another guy that only listens to one weird ass music, and you're yeah. like, holy shit, that's there too. Yeah. But then you realize like, there's a whole other second history. Yeah. To modern music, that goes completely unappreciated, and yeah. unheard. And that kind of blew my mind how fucking brainwashed we are. There's always more, isn't there? There's oh always my more. God. Did so, you... But so er, earlier in this conversation, you were saying, like, in relation to jazz yeah. and that big blue book right. over there, um, that it, it kind of made you feel uh, overwhelmed. A little, a little overwhelmed. Yeah. yeah. And that, that seems to be the conversation I keep hearing around music, around the new uh, muchness. Yeah. After, like the excessive, infinite accessibility. It's, it's people, kind of shut down and go like ah it's too much what do I you know I don't I don't know what to do it, it's 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 intimidating I, and, and what I, do you suggest I, well I just think that we should like why 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 think that well you, also the decision is like is it part of your life or isn't it like you know I went out of my way in recent times music's always been a part of my life and yeah. I've always wanted to be up to speed on things and and hear new things yeah but you, you know with everything else going in the, in, in our lives. Yeah. That, you know, you got to make time to just not even make time. You just got to put it on. Like I have those records in there and I'll just put on records all day. I don't know what they are. And sometimes I'm not even paying that much attention. Right. And I'll just let them go. And occasionally, you know, there's just always music going now. And occasionally I'll go like, Oh, what's that? Sure. And then you go in and you like listen to it again. Yeah. Like I don't, I don't, I don't put too much pressure on myself. No. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the key. Yeah, and maybe maybe people are worried that if they listen to too much music, it becomes a selfish act or time wasting act. Yeah, or, um, I don't know. I, well, you don't have to like you know, it's your choice. Like even with that big stereo in there, people are like you just sit here and listen to records. Sometimes, sometimes I just put them on like we used to. Yeah, you just go flip it, uh-huh. you know, and keep going. Uh-huh. You know, I don't know what people expect. I mean, your job is. I mean, I saw when we were in the house, and uh, you know. I had told you about my new uh, elevated awareness of the kinks. When I put that on, that like I looked over at the couch and I and I saw you in like what must be your listening mode. Uh-huh. Like you're like, but there was a lot going on. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're like, all right, I'll give it another shot. And uh-huh. he, and, and things were going. The yeah. abacus was working. Yeah, and that's a different kind of listening. You know what I loved with that was um, uh, well, we were talking about yeah. how. Uh, I, I I just don't know that record. Like, right, the pre- Village Green Preservation yeah, Society. Yeah, yeah, it's a blind yeah. spot. Right, me. and um, and you're a guy that knows records. Uh, I mean, I'm reading this book and I'm right? looking at this list. I'm like, wait, where the fuck yeah. did that even? Yeah, you know, I, I mean, know. Yeah, apparently I'm, I'm a guy who yeah. does music, but everybody's got blind spots. So that's sure. so that's one. I just never got into the Kinks that much, but um, I like. I couldn't believe that I was hearing this this famous record for the first time. Like it was all new to me. Right. Nothing was right. coming at me like, oh yeah, yeah, I heard this one. Nope. Yeah. Like it, you know, totally new. Yeah. That's weird. You can do that every day though. <laughs> yes, you can. That, but that fits yeah. into what you're yeah. saying. Yeah. Just like I'm I'm hearing shit for the first time. Yeah. Because we, well, I'm doing it on records, but now the party. What you're saying is that. That possibility is, is always there now. Yeah. And it's a, it's a sort of an amazing thing to have that experience. And, but I think we're all prone to thinking like, I missed it or it's too late or right. whatever, but all this stuff happens now. 
It's all happening now. Kind of, yeah. I, I think a lot now about the, the meaning of the past versus the meaning of the present. Yeah, and what do you get? Um, The past is the present. Right. <laughs> it's like, you know, it, uh, the past has great present day meaning. Yep. You know, um, it's all cumulative and relative and is this in relation to music yeah yeah, yeah. because like i have some Art concern in general, maybe, sure you know i guess but like it's sort of like i have this struggle going on in my mind too and i think it's relevant is just that if we lose the context completely yeah you know how do we learn about progress evolution change yeah uh you know the good things yeah. that we're supposed to get from you know surviving yeah uh, that, that, that scares me a little. Sure. But, but with music, I, I, I think it's a little different. Sure. Yeah. Well, um, there have been a lot of, there's been a lot of kind of hand wringing recently about how like we're, all, you know, with music, we're just looking backwards all the time. Now. Right. You know, like we're all, we're, we're into bands that are playing music that sounded like exactly like it was coming from the 1980s right. or the seventies or whatever. Yeah. Um, and you know, there must be something wrong with that. That seems terribly wrong. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that seems like, like, uh, uh, like a lie or something. Or like know? a lie or we're sort of stuck or it's hackneyed or stuck. appropriation yeah, yeah. has taken over originality. Yeah yeah. 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 I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced that it's, that it's a lie. <laughs> yeah. I, th I, th I think there's something real about it, something authentic about it. And maybe this is something actually that I got from, uh, from, uh, you know, a degree in classics. Too. Yeah. Just thinking about the past as something that is continually influencing the, the present. Can we talk about jazz for a few minutes and yeah. then talk about the new system? Sure. The new system. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Cause like, look, I've always liked jazz, but like I said before, I always feel like I'm missing the key to it. Like I like listening to it and I get it and I can jump on the journey. What do I need to know to sort of like, you know, and even when I'm reading your Coltrane book, you know, you're appreciating the timing and the space and, what he's doing that's differently and where it's coming from. And, it, you know, what I got out of that book was I know that people say that jazz comes from the blues and I'm a blues guy, mm -hmm, like, yeah. but I'm a one, four, five blues mm -hmm. guy, just stinky blues. Mm -hmm. And I can go back in time with that and find those rhythms out of Africa or whatever. But like, I, I don't quite understand the shift from blues to jazz. Sure. How that opens up. Right. You know, how does Duke Ellington play in, in, you know, how did the, those guys do you, you know i don't know if you have to worry about that so much no i mean i think that i mean you you because you know one four five you're you're going to be able to hear blues blues language sometimes when it comes up in yeah you know right in in any kind of jazz sure um but then you know i feel like with jazz uh i mean strong melodies are are nice yeah you know they're and that they're they can be durable and usable through the ages or whatever but um jazz is more about um like in, in jazz ma material is almost yeah. neutral uh-huh you know you, what you're dealing with is it's you know it's the whole thing of you know it's not what you do but the way that you do it yeah um so so you're dealing with the sound of a band yeah and 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 how full and integrated and and original maybe this that that group sound is right and how they communicate with each how other they communicate with each other yeah and um i always listen to the drummer first. yeah 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 i listen to the drummer i i focus on that and and listen really hard to what the drummer is doing is he is the drummer is the drummer making the beat different all the time right um, and how is the drummer connected to the bass player? Right. And then who's, who's, who's following whom? Uh huh. And, um, and is it all, is it all one? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, that, that's, that's always my sort of comfortable place to start. Uh -huh. then, then I think about what the soloists are doing. Right, and, right, right. And tone. Uh huh. And, um, logic. So I don't need to be insecure. No. No, no. I want, like, what's the point? What'll it, what'll, well, what'll, what'll, know the, more. Yeah, but I, what'll the insecurity do for you? Nothing. I guess, well, that's a good question throughout the, the entire, that's for me, uh, a, a broader question. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know what you mean. You, you know, like, I mean, that's, that is the question. <laughs> uh, you, you know, some of it's resolving itself. So, uh, I, I think, unfortunately, 
I seem to need to think that I'm, uh, you know, not quite doing it what I need to do. Well, okay. Do you, do you know this? This is your other book. I mean, this is the one I don't have. The Essential Library of Jazz. The Essential Jazz. The Essential Library. New York Times. It's it's the hundred jazz records that, at least in two thousand two or whatever that was. Oh, this will help I, me. I thought one ought to know. Oh, this will help me. You know? Why didn't I have this before? Don't know. But see, the weird thing is, is like, how do you decide that, like, how do you decide this Jerry Mulligan record <laughs> is the record? I mean, he's one of those guys. What's he got? Like 30 records out? More. So you listen to all of them? No. <laughs> <laughs> see, so you're not a complete shit. You're not the guy that has the, the, you're not the catalog guy. You're not the guy that's like, you're okay. But... With making the decision. If, 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 if we had to, to know everything. Yeah. Before making a decision about something, we would never do anything. We'd just be frozen. No time. We'd be sitting there frozen. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. shaking. Right. <laughs> That's my life. <laughs> that maybe I should have more acceptance. No, I think, I think you can deal with, um, okay. You know, about the new, the new way of listening, the, mm -hmm. um, I think that, um, like we have the good thing that, that, that uh, immediate infinite access uh -huh. does for us is that, um, it can, it can give us the sort of outline of a musician's career right. really fast. Right. So, um, the, the example I always think of is like, let's say somebody dies, you know, like Lemmy dies. Right. And, um, and you, see it coming up on your Facebook or whatever. And mm -hmm. you're like, I don't know who Lemmy is. So you, so you look up that and, you know, within two minutes, you, you've got, um, you can see all, all the lower head records. Right. And, and you can find a place that tells you, you know, what the best period sure. was and whatever. And you can kind of, you can figure this all out in about an hour. Right. You know, you can see the outline of the whole thing. Sure. Between seeing the records and just doing a Wikipedia or whatever. Yeah. On, online, you can kind of get the arc. Yeah. And so, I think that's useful for some for some artist that has you know eighty records. No, it is. Yeah, it, it, it is useful, and it's also like the weird thing is, is somebody like him, where you know that's a sound, that's a lifestyle. Yeah, you know that's a, a there's a method there that you know if you're going to lock into that, you, it, there's not going to be necessarily a lot of new things. There's not going to be a period of Lemmy. Unless you go back to Hawkwind for those two records where yeah. he played bass and sang some, that it's going to shift a lot. Yeah. And there's a, there, I guess there's a comfort, but there's also a sort of like, if you're one of those people that needs to hear everything, you can kind of like hear the, the, the important records and then kind of click through the other nine records. Yeah. The, yeah. All right. So that now I have this. Yeah. What do you, do you, what do you think of Kamasi Washington? I really like him. Great. Right. Mm hmm. Yeah. I, I really like him. Now let me just ask you a question. Mm -hmm. Like I'm coming at jazz, you know. I know, like I've listened to it. Mm -hmm. I listened closely to it. I read our Pepper's uh, autobiography. Uh -huh. But when I put on that Kamasi record, yeah. You know, first of all, epic and the cover art and the fact that his first record is three records. So like, yeah. all right, the, he means business. Yeah. And I talked to him in here. Yeah. Nice guy. It's great guy. Yeah. He's yeah, a smart sweet, guy. Sweet guy. Got his shit together. Mm -hmm. But when I put that record on, like right away, like. I was like, there's a lot happening here. Yeah. And and then when I found out that it was all played live, I'm like, the production, this must have taken hours mm -hmm. to sort of like take that, put that here. But he does it all live. Right. That's baffling. Yeah. I think that record would go into the, the density chapter. Yeah. In, in my book. <laughs> um, but uh yeah, well those the guys in Kamasi's band have all played together since they you know for, kids. since they were kids. Which is that's so meaningful, um, because of the communication. Thing. Yeah, right. Yeah, um, uh, and the I mean, the, I I only started to see them. I came out to L.A. like a year before the record came out. Yeah, and I saw that band for for the first time. All ninety of them. Yeah, well, <laughs> it was maybe only ten that night. Okay, only, I know people out here have known about them for a long time. Yeah, but but. In, you know, in New York, we just don't hear about what Kamasi, we, we, we didn't know about him. Yeah. So, and, and I had that very pleasant experience seeing him and his band for the first time of like, what is going on? I don't get it. Yeah. You know, like, 
I don't understand how this group knows what one another is doing all the I just don't get like this is right. mysterious to me but it was great this, right it was really good <laughs> yeah. and um I, I I guess you learn to trust yourself too that when when you have that feeling of like I right. like this I like this a lot and I don't and I don't know where I am in well, right I don't, I don't know I don't know what's going on that's a really good uh that's you can trust that that's the magic thing yeah where you like there's something whole here well, and, yeah, and it's connecting with me. Yeah, music is is mysterious. Yes, like it's supposed to be that way. Yeah, that's why it does. You know. Yeah, music is not words. Yeah, there was a. I can remember all those things, uh, and I imagine that with this this one, the uh, the the essential jazz library here, this book, the these records that that there's definitely you can really remember when your mind got blown. Yeah, with music. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can remember, you know, who turns you on to it, you know, where because you're it's usually every time you get, you know, whether it's you buying a record or whether it's someone going, you got to listen to this. It's almost like this portal opens to an unknown world. Yeah. Where you're like, holy shit. Yeah. All right. Let's talk. Let's I, I feel like we could keep doing this with every artist that we talk yeah. about. But I do want to sort of engage in, yeah. you know, the 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 desire to create a context where there is none. Mm hmm. Uh, in this world where we can have anything anytime right yeah. now you could say like can we listen to some throat singing from tuva right. i could be like hang on a second sure yeah and, and there it is yeah when for, the first time i heard that i'm like there's a lot going on I don't know <laughs> <laughs> right yeah <laughs> well so, i mean i got i got really interested in um i got really interested in the tradition of the 20th century tradition of music appreciation like yeah. the music appreciation movement there was a um, movement yeah like starting in late 1800s and then going really up to the 50s or 60s uh -huh. there there were a lot of a lot of um, books that came out um um with the basic premise of so you want to be a reasonably educated person about music right here's what you ought to know right um and it t it was an attempt to democratize taste and all you know so, yeah um so there were these very influential widely read books that came out and and you know things that they were taught in you know in in high schools and stuff right um and it was really entirely about just about just almost entirely about western classical music right sort of like Bach to Brahms and um and so I mean all that that movement is totally dead. Yeah. You know, for many reasons. Yeah. One of which is that we now understand that the Western classical music is just like one thing among many right. out there. And um, I thought, but there's something about those books that I found really interesting. And I thought, well, if a book like that were to be written now, what would it look like? And I thought, well, the, fir the first thing I thought was it wouldn't be about what the composer wants you to understand. Right. Because listeners have so much more power now. So it might be more about what it feels like to listen, you know? So in a way, this book, Every Song Ever, is like a, is like a music appreciation book from the listener side of things. Right. And instead of, um, of writing about music in terms of genres or movements or, um, you know, this is harmony, this is melody, this is rhythm. I'm writing, the, the chapters are based on, um, experiences of hearing repetitive music. Right. Experiences of hearing slow music. Right. Like, you know, things that like everybody understands yeah. what slow. Right. Slowness is. Sure. Re repetition. Yes. Yeah. You don't need to, you don't need to have heard any song. Right. You know, to know yeah. what that right. is. Right. Um, so I just feel like this, these could be keys to, you know, so you like one kind of slow song. Well, maybe you might like another kind of slow song from the 16th century. You know, that well, you have one not that's encountered before, or from another continent, or from a culture that is that is different from your own, or some uh, you know experimental musician. Sure, yeah. There's a chapter about quiet, yeah, and si uh, quiet and silence, that kind of thing. That, that's different than slow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is. Well, <laughs> you have to be really slow to be quiet, I guess. <laughs> But you, but that's the, it's, but those are the headings of these essays. There's slowness, speed. There's quiet, silence, intimacy. Yeah. Uh, stubbornness and the single note. Yeah. Yeah. And you're able to track it. 
you know, with songs. So that's, I think that's the beautiful thing about what makes this book, you know, modern and relevant is that, you know, I went on Spotify and I checked out the, you know, you put together uh, uh, a list. What do they call it? The Spotify. Uh, uh, My publisher, Farrar Strauss, made, yeah. made a made a Spotify playlist of like almost every piece of music I refer to in this book, and it's, it's great. Fifteen hours long. Right. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. in in these chapters, yeah, like um, I mean, the sort of s- stealth thesis of the book is that we should all listen to everything. You know, I mean, like what what's why why should we limit ourselves right so um so genre is kind of out the window in this book and um so like the repetition chapter i write about james brown and steve reich yeah and um uh rihanna mm-hmm. and uh i don't know kesha yeah well, I, I yeah i i mentioned i mentioned uh a kesha song but um just all these, all these different pieces of music that, that use repetition. Yeah. And I write about what, what is it, what does that mean? How does repetition work on you as a listener? What's right. it all about? Mm-hmm. And this is not a, one of these neurological books about listening. No. You know, I, I'm not a scientist. I don't, I don't understand that, but I can write about it as a listener, as mm-hmm. an essayist, as somebody who knows something about how, how music works. Yeah. And, um, and these are, and these are suggestions. Yeah, Ab- about about how to think about kinds of listening experiences. Like these 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 twenty ways to listen are not the twenty ways to listen. It's just a way. It's it's to get people thinking about how they can about how they're how they're good listeners. Right, and also, you know? and, and I think the the biggest trick in terms of people that will be interested, you, you know. Um, that want to think about this stuff. You know, I think as a, as a critic and also as somebody, you know, who wants to have an open mind and be an educated, sophisticated person. Yeah. I think mostly uh, what stops people from doing it is like, that sucks. Right. And, and then, and then what stops people from opening their mind is like, who the hell's that guy? Also, there's, <laughs> so there's a thing of like, who the hell is this, some... this Ratliff dude? Yeah. What does he know? Well, there's that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm familiar with that. But then there's the thing when you're listening, yeah, there can be that reaction of somebody like me doesn't like that kind of music. Right. Someone like me, this music is not for someone like me. Right. I and ah, that bothers me. Yeah, it bothers me too because like a lot of times like I I mean, I I I don't think I've quite said that. What I usually say is like I don't know a lot about that. Yeah. You know, I I don't know like because when people go hip hop, I'm like, I, you know, I didn't grow up with hip hop, so it's not like it's not a fundamental to me. Yeah. But like I, I've listened to a few, you, you know, uh, Kanye records, Jay Z records, Cypress Hill records, you know, even going Ghetto Boys records, NW. I mean, I've listened to those over and over again. But for me, the primary reason with rap or hip hop is like I'm not fundamentally a lyrics guy, and the the amount of active listening I have to do is a little a little hard. I was going to ask you about that. You know, because we were listening to that Kinks record, yeah, and everybody talks about Ray Davies being uh being really good with with Lyrics. words, yeah, he um, is. And I was about to confess to you that I think I'm maybe not. Words are not really the highest priority. For oh, me. not me either. I mean, I, I love words. <laughs> I rarely know what but, they're saying. Uh huh. And yeah. it's weird because I don't process it. And like I've had to recently try. You know, there's certain songs like. There are certain songs I know the words to. Yeah. And blues songs there I know the words to. Some Velvet Underground songs, some yeah, but sometimes words aren't even easy to hear. Yeah. I like they're you know, country songs I can take the words and I enjoy listening to them. But but for the most part, you know, I, I'm listening for for tone and for mood and for rhythm and for how I feel. You know, and it's, it's it uh rarely until like and I'm a I'm a writer guy, I like poetry. Yeah. But when it comes to music I'm not, it's not my first thing. I want to rock. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. You want that feeling. Yeah, I do. That, that feeling. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that motion. Yeah. You want that feeling of yeah, motion. Yeah. Yeah. But so back to jazz for a minute. Sure. I mean, you're a, you're a stand up comedian. Yeah. So, so you know about improvising. Right. But like, I just recently, like as of the last two days, you're, you're getting me a good, good day here yeah. that, you know, you hear about that. Yeah. You hear about riffing. I, I want to talk about that word. Okay. 
C- can we do a little sidebar now? Sure. Yeah. R- um, riffing. Mm-hmm. I always understood r- the r- riff to mean like a short, repeated statement. I think you know, that is, yeah. Like, right. Do, no, 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 no. Right, know, right. Whatever. Yeah, power riff. A short thing repeated. Right. You know? But then I think maybe in comedy, the word mm-hmm. took on another meaning. Oh, yeah. Which is the opposite. Mm-hmm. Meaning. Uh, improvising, improvising, going all over the place, right? Never necessarily coming. What back do jazz to... guys call it? Uh, I don't know. I mean, in jazz, we talk about riffs being those short, repeated statements. Uh-huh. You know, like Ellington wrote great riffs, right? Riff, right, the catchy riff, thing. Riff tunes, sure. Where, um, I don't know, but anyway, I feel like the it's it's one of those curious words that has over time changed its meaning completely. Uh huh. And so I wanted to ask you, like. Well, riffing. What, have you always been aware of that word to mean? Yeah, just going, going on. Yeah, I thought that's what it meant, and never necessarily. I never coming even, back but, to but I knew a. the definition you're telling me. Yeah. but I never really thought that there was something in like I know a power riff. Yeah, 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 and that, and they're important. Yeah, you know, like that people talk about the the riffs that have defined rock music. That's right, sure, but riffing, I guess, yeah, maybe it has taken on a different meaning, but it does mean improvising. So let me shift yes. it yes. in terms of like. Like I had this realization about what you, and I think I might have gotten it, you know, in some ways from reading the amount that I read in the Coltrane book was that, cause I, I write improvisationally. I don't write jokes. So like it all happens on stage. It all has to be organic. It all starts with conversation. It all starts with me thinking out loud and finding it. That's just the way I do it. I've yeah. always done it that way. Uh, it's not an easy way to do things. Right. But it takes a certain amount of confidence and willingness to, to, to you know, run into the dirt. Yeah. You know, you can fucking go and then you just end up in a ditch. Yeah. Uh, but you start to find the things that work. And then like for me, it's always been about like, well, get, there's other places that you can go further. Mm-hmm. So w- what I do is that if I'm on stage and I, and I have a premise and that gets a laugh in that moment, if I'm feeling it, you just keep going. Mm-hmm. And, and then, and that's how, that's how I write. Like, I don't know where it comes from. I don't know where it's delivered from, but it's that moment where that happens for the first time. And I'm like, that, that was the whole show for me. Like they can walk out after an hour and go, like, I really like the show. And I'm like, yeah, but that one line, <laughs> that, that was it. That uh-huh. was, that was what was delivered. Uh-huh. And I know that, but like you were saying with Coltrane and these cats is that once you lay down the groove and the structures there, like the blues, like that's, I think what I'm drawing from essentially uh-huh. is that whatever the one, four, five or whatever the minors are, whatever they add to that, that, you know, that's, that's the groundwork and that's where you depart from and you can land there. Sure. Right. That's, that's right. That's, that's the groundwork. That's the, uh, the framework. Right. And the, or the consensual language between a group of people. And that I started to realize more concisely about what I do, not to, I'm not tooting my own horn, it's just the way I work that, you know, you do it innately. Yeah. It's like, well, here's the shit. We're warmed up, table set. Now yeah. let's go. Yeah. And I'll come back later. Right. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? But you also must be really proud of certain things you've done that involve brilliant structure. Well, that's the last special I did. I was very clear about it. I'm going to yeah. repeat this shit. Yeah. And I'm going to get it tight. Yeah. And there's going to be callbacks. Yeah. And it's all going to come around at the end. Right. And there's a, you know, there's a, a little bit of an arc to it. Right. It's a piece. Right. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. But I'm, I'm not fundamentally like that because I like, I don't know if it comes from the insecurity or not. I like it when it's sort of loose and like I can walk away going like, I didn't think that would happen. <laughs> right. You know, but, but that's an act too on t- sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. But in, in the book, what you do throughout it all is you, you provide this, this context of appreciation. Mm-hmm. That's really what you're doing. And yes. I guess what I was saying before was that even when I read a book like this, there are moments where you think that it's not so much of a pressure on me as a listener or, you know, whether or not I trust you or your tone. It, it, there, there's something that implies like, you know, like, no, nah, I got homework, you know, in some level in a way. So like in the sense that like I'm listening to the Spotify list and I'm enjoying it and I'm mm-hmm. going through stuff and I'm, I'm seeing how it connects to, you know, the essay headings and, mm-hmm. you know, what your point you're trying to make. But I think that's one of the reasons why. Just in general, politically, personally, otherwise, people don't like change. They don't mm-hmm. like uh, new things necessarily because mm-hmm. they're set in their ways. Mm-hmm. But I think what you provide here is this, this, if they look at the book, 
as a, you know, kind of a, a fun, you know, process. Yeah. That, you know, you can open minds because, you, you know, how many, it doesn't matter if people go back to it. It just matters that, you know, you've widened the, <laughs> the, the perception. That's it. That's right. It. Yeah. And, um, like, I mean, I see that I, I feel that that is its own virtue. Mm -hmm. I really do. Like, you know, what, what good is it to know about, um, Cuban music if you want to know more about punk? It, it, in a way, it doesn't it doesn't make sense, but I just feel that it it gives you a wider frame of reference. Yeah. Having having a wider frame of reference is just intrinsically good. No, absolutely. And that, but also that was the job I stepped into twenty years ago. Is like, um, uh, you know, one of my predecessors was this guy uh, Robert Palmer. Yeah, I remember and, him. And he and the people that followed him. He was a rock guy though primarily, wasn't he? But he wrote about jazz yeah. and Cuban music and African music yeah. and whatever and he was just he was wide open, you know. And by the time I got there in 96, that was kind of what I was expected to do and it was amazing to, that, that that the expectation was that, you know, I'd be writing about um Orna Coleman one day and um Janet Jackson the next day, and, right? You know, and a, a, a metal band. So that was part of your education. Oh yeah, yeah, and I'm I'm really grateful for that. I, specialized knowledge is a weird thing. I mean, you know, having having done this kind of work for a long time, I'm I'm always running into people who know everything about this. You topic. don't want to be that guy, though. No, I don't. No, and I'm glad those people exist because they're very very helpful for an hour. Sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Or or in small doses. Yeah. Because they because they're that see that's the the the, the nerd element of that mm -hmm. of the specialized nerd mm -hmm. is so control oriented and and also sort of like you know I know it all. Yeah. Yeah. But you're right. They're useful. But you know you, you have to limit your coffee time. I also don't want to feel like I own anything. Yeah. You know, I don't want to feel like a sense of, um, property right. about any, yeah, yeah. any of this, you know, um, um, and, and want, or wanting to patrol it. Uh, right. Um, I just want to, I want to connect things. Yeah. You yeah. know, like I want, I want to describe, interpret, connect. So you're, you're gunning for the, uh, the thing, like we talked about before, the one thing that if it wasn't there, yeah. yeah, everything would fall apart in music in t as an entirety. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's it. Oh boy, that's it. Yeah, you want to pull the curtain back? <laughs> you probably, I don't know. <laughs> that's gonna be a lifelong thing, I think. Well, also, again, it's like the results of of the training because you go to a con. We don't really write about concerts anymore in, mm -hmm. in the New York Times. It's kind of weird. Or we, why or, is that? You think? Um, very recently, the the it's been understood that the the most concert reviews don't get read widely enough. So we're why because if people think like, well, I wasn't there, or is there another one coming up? Or? That's definitely part of it. Yeah, I think maybe people are tired of the box with text in it called review. Right. Oh yeah. I yeah, think yeah they want yeah. something different. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So um. Uh. Anyway, I you know for twenty years. I go to a concert. I've got my notebook. Uh -huh. I just write things down because it's a habit, but I don't use practically anything right. th that I've written down. Right. What it comes down to the next morning when I'm writing is I remember something, just a little detail, yeah. Yeah. one or two things, right. and that's where I'm going to start from. That The act of writing sometimes just solidifies it in the brain. Yeah. yeah. So do you dance? Um, A little. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I move. Oh, good. I move. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah, that's good. No, I mean, I'm, you know, uh, I don't, you mean, do I go out and dance? Do I go to clubs to dance? Well, I no, mean, like no. at home, like, you know, when you're listening to your guy yeah. listens to a lot of music. Yeah. Do you move, you, you sure. move around a little Absolutely. bit? Absolutely. Oh, good. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I want to, I want to know how that feels. Yeah. 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 You yeah, know, yeah. like, um, that's sort of what it's all about. Yeah. You know, yeah. Engagement on. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Get something going. Yeah. You know? I don't do it out, out in public as much. Sometimes I'll do it at home a bit. You know, I'll feel it. You know? Yeah. I don't know why. Like, I think someone's got to write a book about dance that, like this book. Like, I, I think it feels like dancing is a joyous thing that, like, we're all a little embarrassed to do. 
Like I, you know, like I think that if everybody danced a little bit, like maybe if there was a dance break yeah. during the day in this country, like other countries take naps, it might yeah. be it might be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great idea. Yeah, dance day. That's a really great idea. Well, it was good talking to you. Do you, you feel like too. we did it? I think we did, did it. something. I think we did it. Yeah. Yeah. You want you want to hear a a a, a one song of that remixed? Get your yayas out on my system. Yes, I do. <laughs> All right, Ben. Thanks for talking. Thank you. Okay, that was a pretty full episode. I hope you all go out and buy some jazz records. Get that epic, Kamasi Washington. Before we go, I want to thank our new sponsor, Magic Jack. Take your small business phone system to the cloud and save thousands. It's unbeatable reliability at an incredible price, no nickel and diming. It's got 99.99% uptime with professional features like an auto attendant, music on hold, virtual fax, and more. There's a 30-day satisfaction guarantee. Get two months free service when you sign up at magicjackforbusiness.com slash WTF. Be one of the first 100 and get a free phone. Go to WTFPod.com for all your WTF pod needs. No music today. I got to go to set. I'm shooting a thing. Glow. Gorgeous ladies of wrestling. I'll tell you more about that. I will tell you a little, a little tidbit here at the end, but, um, you know, my character 